It is a nice day. I have some very bad news for you, children. Your parents have perished in a terrible fire. Viewers may rejoice to find themselves back in the land of dark, elaborate children's fantasy with Netflix's Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events, based on the book by Daniel Handler. As the precocious Baudelaire orphans flee the grotesque villain Count Olaf, the limited adults around them prove absurdly unhelpful often catapulting the children into further danger. The series evokes Salman Rushdie's observation about The Wizard of Oz, that the film's driving force is the quote, inadequacy of adults, even of good adults, and how the weakness of grown-ups forces children to take control of their own destinies. Looking closer at unfortunate events and the genre of dark children's stories since Oz, we notice a number of common features that might seem surprising incompetent and unreliable adults who stubbornly refuse to ever listen to children, surrogate families and friends who substitute for the actual family bond, weird, wild, wacky worlds that are vibrant and fun but also disconcerting, real darkness and danger, including a wicked, potentially world-destroying villain that the child must somehow vanquish, and ultimately the need for children to grow stronger by realizing they can't depend on these disappointing adults. The children in the story or watching or reading it must overcome their fears of inadequacy, slay the beast, and become whole, self-sufficient beings. Count Olaf is a madman. We can't stay with him. He struck Klaus across the face. I'm sorry you don't have a good first impression of him. At the beginning of each episode, narrator Lemony Snicket, played by Patrick Warburton, exhorts viewers to... I beg you turn this program off now. Imagine this story has a happy ending. Look away, look away. The show will wreck your evening, your whole life and your day. Every single episode is nothing but dismay. We can't say we haven't been warned. But like kids being told no, we immediately want to do exactly what we're told not to do. So we keep watching, naively hoping for a happy ending, even though we're told There's this no is not going to happen. He's not here and not now. This tale is all sorrows and woes. As this forbidding adult figure, Snicket turns us into the kids, even if we're actually adult viewers. We root for the wonderful children, Violet, Klaus, and Baby Sunny, appalled by the terrible adults causing mischief and disaster all around them. I had my star reporter write an article for the front page so that everyone will know your home was destroyed and you're orphans now. The children have been orphaned by a fire in the family mansion. Thus, the first way they've been abandoned by adults is literal and physical. Their parents are dead and gone. But as I believe Mr. Poe has explained to you, I can act loco parentheses. In loco parentis. Poco de Laurentiis! In loco parentis. The point is, I can order you to participate, and you must obey. Obvious, crude, unintelligent villain Count Olaf barely bothers to disguise his goal of stealing the Baudelaire fortune. Enormous fortune. Who else has such robust good looks and such a large amount? I'm handsome and I'm talented and love your bank account! It's the count, it's the Olaf and his theatrical troupe of comically vile henchpersons are hardly evil masterminds or even very good at what they do, yet this doesn't stop Olaf from repeatedly gaining guardianship over the children, because this world of adults is so exceedingly blind and incompetent. He's only three miles away and your parents' will was very specific about you being raised by your closest living relative. Does he really think that's what closest living relative means? Most strikingly, the adult world refuses to ever listen to the children, and their frustration is one that many real kids can identify with. Can't you see, Mr. Poe? That's Count Olaf! Aunt Josephine, this is not the sea captain, this is Count Olaf. We've already told you, Captain Shem is Count Olaf in disguise. Now then, I know you three have had some terrible experiences, but you mustn't start letting your imaginations get the best of you. Remember when you were staying with Uncle Monty? You were convinced that his assistant Stefano was actually Count Olaf in disguise. Stefano was actually Count Olaf in disguise. <laughs> Mr. Poe, the banker who appoints guardians for the children, epitomizes the incompetent adult. Though I may be in line for promotion, so that's not how you spell promotion. Promotion, P-R-O-M-A-R-R. Honey, P-R-R, listen. If I had lost those orphans, I'd be getting a promotion right now. Adults like Poe never learn from or take responsibility for their mistakes. He knows where he came from. You put us in his care. And are easily brainwashed by the most flimsy disguises or explanations, as long as they use adult-sounding language and formats. The Baudelaire's do attract some would-be friendly souls, kind, lonely neighbor Justice Strauss, 
heroic herpetologist Uncle Monty, and fragile Aunt Josephine. But Olaf can manipulate all of them by tapping into their delusions and unfulfilled desires. Whereas the Baudelaire kids see without delusion. Like the kids in Narnia, the Baudelaires resemble adults in miniature, with excellent abilities. While the adults are far more childlike than the children, Olaf can barely spell or speak grammatically, whereas the Baudelaire kids speak with the precision of professors. You don't know the difference between figuratively and literally, do you? What emerges embodied by Poe is an inverted world in which the smartest and most reliable people are three young children. On one level, this inverted world in which adults are stupid and children are smart is simply a fun storytelling technique. It's an enjoyable reversal for viewers who are constantly being told the opposite, that kids don't know anything. I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm big, you're little. I'm right, you're wrong. And there's nothing you can do about it. Even adult viewers, all too aware that they don't know everything, find it cathartic to see their flawed and artificial grown-up world so exuberantly mocked in a child's eye. On another level, this world creates a void against which the children can grow and shine, instead of being spoiled by parental love and help. Thus, this miserable world which gives them nothing, at least provides them with the opportunity to become fine human beings on their own. Back in 1939, young Dorothy Gale of Kansas also found her adults frustrating and unfair. But even in Oz, when Dorothy and friends arrive at the brilliant green Emerald City, the wizard they've been seeking turns out to be yet another incompetent adult. In unfortunate events, a running plot involves a pair of people we think are the returning, not-dead Baudelaire parents. But, spoiler alert, this turns out to be a red herring. In both stories, we hold out hope that some good and dependable adults will finally save the children from this nightmare. But the stories reject this possibility. Apart from a few helpers with limited power, the children are really on their own. They must so rescue themselves. The Baudelaire children are a family unit unto themselves. They learn to parent each other. The children direct comfort and look out for one another. Many children's stories provide a new band of companions. The stand-in family group becomes a substitute for the disappointing real family, a learning mechanism for bonding and working together with peers, and on the symbolic or figurative level, the companions, especially animal or enchanted companions, can represent pieces of the child's self, which need actualization and growth. Harry Potter meets Hermione, who excels in learning and intelligence, and Ron, who embodies loyalty and a generous spirit. Harry grows over the years, largely thanks to internalizing these qualities from his best friends. The Dark Materials trilogy goes further with the metaphor of the companion as missing parts of the child self. The demon here is literally the child's soul externalized. We realize the journey in Oz is really a journey inward. The wizard's final lesson is that all the treasures they seek are inside themselves all along. You've always had the power to go back to Kansas. Just as any child might learn, she really does possess all the brain's heart, courage, and the inner compass she needs. Oz gives children the advice, follow the yellow brick road. Sticking to the right path with your friends will eventually get you to your destination. Unfortunate Events takes place somewhere not now and not here, both more beautiful and more dreadful than our world. The production design of the show creates the feeling of a storybook come to life. The vibrant colors and dimensionality of the children themselves are alive against the frequently drab, flat backdrop they're forced to inhabit. The interplay of bright and drab and of round, three-dimensional shapes against flatness visually embodies this clash of the child's point of view, more alive, noble, smart, and right, and the deadened adult's point of view. Unfortunate Events takes after Oz in this juxtaposition of black and white sepia or gray tones and jewel tone primary colors. Color represents a child's process of awakening to a world of dreams that's somehow more real than waking life. The world is scary and we should be afraid. No matter where we go, Con Olaf will be there. No matter who we tell, no one will listen to us. There is nowhere safe for us. And no guardian can help us. With angular, pointy images and a wild use of color, Alice's Mad Wonderland fills us with unease as much as excitement. As the darkness is introduced, the term young adult becomes appropriate. These stories introduce a child to adult realities like the existence of evil, the difficulty of immediately telling villains from friends, and the complexity of the world, which is both friendly and hostile in myriad ways. 
Even though it can be hard to identify good from bad at first, these stories arrive at more extreme villains and heroes, or evils and goods, in battle with each other. The heroes of these fantasies, like the unfortunate children, tend to be young and small. The villains all possess the will to power, terrifying physical or magical strength, spite and hatred for the races they rule, and the determination to extinguish all opponents. Count Olaf is not exactly a destroyer of worlds, yet he uses his seemingly puny talents to fool and conquer this messed up, incompetent adult world. And he matches those others in his purely evil intention. The pure evil represents a worldview of hate and selfishness that the children must vanquish, and thus defeat the enemy within oneself. Yes, there's no happy endings, not here and not now. This tale is all sorrows and woes. In many of these stories, the alternate weird world is temporary. The children return as better, more grown people to their original yet altered real world. In unfortunate events, the Baudelaire's wish very much to escape, but they're trapped in this nightmare, at least for the foreseeable future. In the threshold into young adulthood, children realize that they're entering a flawed world. Growing up means becoming strong enough to survive in this world that's harsh and not fair. And so, we reluctantly learn to expect the worst. Whatever ending this Lemony Snicket adaptation finally lands on, if the predecessors of dark children's fantasy have taught us anything, it's that the answer won't lie in the adults. The children must rely on themselves and their peers to reach their fullest potential in a world that continues to disappoint. We can survive Count Olaf. Showtime.